we all have a lot to think about now. Yeah. <laughs> um, our final speaker is Dr. Bauman. He graduated magna cum laude from Princeton University and received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. He did his residency and was chief resident at Harvard's Joint Center for Radiation Therapy. He served as chief of radiation oncology at Walter Reed Medical Center while also serving as the associate program director for the National Cancer Institute's program to train resident physicians in this specialty. He was appointed as the con um, consul consultant to the Surgeon General for the specialty of radiation oncology. He came to Princeton as the first director of radiation oncology and was elected by the physicians to serve as a, term, as a term as the president of the medical staff at the University Medical Center of Princeton. He was selected as one of the best physicians in the New York, New Jersey region by the Castle Connolly organization every year. He has published multiple articles in the field of radiation oncology. He's board certified in radiation oncology and currently serves as the Director of Radiation Oncology at the Edward and Marie Matthews Cancer Center at the University Med Medical Center of Princeton. Oh, good afternoon. I hope you find uh, these sorts of uh, gatherings as informative as uh, I do, although I have to admit it was a little disconcerting to discover that uh, I've already had every one of those triggers for midlife crisis. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, I don't think I have to worry very much about the Asian aging face, but uh, I think some of those uh, things that were uh, put up there unfortunately apply to me too. And, and I have to say, I've never seen eyelids so up, up close and never noticed them before, but I'm going to start looking at creases now, like my own in the mirror next. So those are things that apply to all of us in one way or the other. And I'm going to talk now about some things that I very much hope will not apply to you. But sadly, one out of every five of us in this room is going to need at some time in their life the services of someone like me. Now, cancer strikes one out of every three of us. And cancer basically affects almost every family in the world at some time or another. So even though what I'm talking about here today you have at least a four out of five chance you will never personally experience some of the technology I'm talking about. The odds, unfortunately, are very good that someone near and dear to you will. And my point in all this and telling you about this technology is to let you know several things. One, there is now wonderful technology to help patients with cancer. The things that I have to use to help cancer patients here at this community hospital would have been unthinkable when I was at Harvard not that many years ago. That's how fast the technology has advanced. And it is very comforting to know that in the community we have the capability of delivering treatments with the same sophistication that in the old days would have forced you to go to one of the really big cancer centers in the country. Now these same treatments are available, at least here on the East Coast, to uh, people within easy reach of their home environment. So that's my prelude to talking to you a little bit about some advances in radiation oncology, and particularly with an emphasis on the kinds of things that we have now at our new cancer center. Now, one of the most important advances in radiation oncology actually has nothing to do with my specialty directly. It's a result of advancements 
in the sister specialty of diagnostic imaging, or radiology. Radiology has come a long way in recent years. Uh, I hate to admit this, but when I was a medical student, the first CAT scans were just becoming available. And later, I lived through the first MRIs, and I've watched how they have advanced in sophistication and their ability to define the location of tumors. And we take advantage of those advances in diagnostic imaging, particularly the MRIs, and also the PET scans. PET scans were something that uh, existed until a, a decade ago, mostly in the basement of huge research hospitals. No one ever dreamed that they would be available readily in the community. And no one certainly ever dreamed that uh, someone in my specialty would have a PET scan to play with to uh, define the location of tumors. So we take advantage of these different imaging modalities to do something very important, which is to define with precision the location of our cancer target. If you can't define the target, you don't have much chance of killing the cancer. So we use all of these different modalities. And another great advance that has occurred is some computer geniuses have figured out the very complex problem of how to blend two completely different images together so that you can use the blended image to further refine your ability to detect targets. Now think about that. These are images taken with people in different positions. They're taken on totally different machines with different technology, and yet computer programs can attempt to compensate for that, can distort the image until it corresponds to the same position on the two different modalities and produce an image that we take advantage of. And one of the ways we take advantage of this is by using a machine called a simulator. A simulator is the machine that we use to practice on before we actually start to deliver a radiation treatment. And it is just as important as any other piece of equipment in our armamentarium. And our simulators produce CAT scan images. And it is to those CAT scan images that we fuse PET scans and MRIs to try to give us the most accurate picture of the target that we want to uh, aim at. Now here, for example, you see two images. On the left, you see a CT image. The little circles you see actually are the location of a small lesion in the brain. But trust me, on that CAT scan image, you can't see it. I can't see it, and the radiologist can't see it. But if you look to the right, the same patient, that's an MRI image. You see the much greater detail of brain structures. And in that little circle, you may just detect that little white dot. That's the enhancing lesion. This is a tiny cancer. And what we can do with our fusion of images is we can use the image that best shows the target, the one on the right, and we can outline that image slice by slice in a series of cross-sectional images, and it appears on the image that we took in the treatment planning position, which is the image on the left. We also confuse CAT scans with PET scans. What you see on the right is a PET scan. Now, if you look at that, that's a pretty murky image. On the left is a CAT scan, same region of the body, same patient, and again, we're taking advantage of the fact that the PET scan doesn't look at anatomy, it looks at how your cells operate. It looks at what cells in your body are burning sugar. Because some of your cells are not supposed to be burning sugar. Your brain is, your heart is, but a lot of your structures burn fatty acids. So if we find sugar being burned somewhere where it shouldn't be burned, that's cancer or inflammation. So we take advantage of a completely different modality, again, to allow us to place a target on the image on the left, which is the image we will plan our treatments on. And this is the advanced CT simulator that we have at this hospital that is typical of those uh, scanners that we use 
to define the location of the tumor before we deliver any treatment. Now these scanners, a few short years ago, would have been absolutely uh, unbelievably capable for diagnostic purposes. Okay? These are so much better than CAT scanners were even a few years ago that it's astonishing the quality of the images that they produce for us to better define targets than we ever could in the past. Now, one of the things that these simulators allow us to do is what we call four-dimensional simulation. We're all familiar with the three-dimensional world, but in fact, you actually live in a four-dimensional world. The fourth dimension is time. Now, if you look at the image there, that's an image taken from CAT scans, and you'll see uh, right over here, there's a, a lump in the lump. That's the typical image that people see. It's a static image. But you know, that's not actually what this looks like in four dimensions. In four dimensions, it looks more like you see down below. It's moving. It's changing its position. And if you targeted that tumor in one static position, you've just missed. A patient will die. That's the stakes that we're playing with. So these simulators that we have are capable of simulating in four dimensions, taking into account the movement of lesions in the body over time. And the whole process of delivering a radiation treatment for the control of cancer starts with that simulation procedure. Patients are positioned, as you see in the top here, you've seen the same patient from the front and from the side, they're placed in a position that we can reproduce whenever we want to. In this case, the patient is actually encased in kind of a cast here, so that each day when they come in, we can place them in that cast and we know we've got them positioned in the same way. Then once positioned on that uh, cast, we then obtain the CAT scan images on the simulator. And we have a very elaborate system, again, that lets us see how things move with respirations to produce the kind of images that we see down here below which is the images that we'll use to actually plan the patient's treatment to ensure that we don't miss the target. Now, what the CAT scan simulator produces is a series of cross-sectional images like this. And we look at each one of these sequential images that are taken every two to three millimeters apart, all the way through the relevant section of the anatomy. And on the computer, we actually sit down and we outline all of the anatomy and the targets that we're interested in, slice by slice by slice. I'll tell you, it's an incredibly tedious process. But what we can do with the aid of incredibly powerful computers is stack these two-dimensional images up to form a three-dimensional picture view. Think of it like, like uh, stacking uh, slices of bread up to form a whole loaf of bread. We're interested in the whole loaf but in order to define something within that loaf, we have to see it slice by slice. So we, we do that process, and it produces, again, images such as you see here. This is the same tumor looking at it from three different ways. This is looking at this lung cancer, the black is the lung, from uh, as though we had sliced right through you. This is looking at it from the front. I think it's a little hard for me to see it here. And, uh, and this is looking at it, the bottom picture, from the side. So we can define this target with great precision, as I said, in three dimensions with the planning capabilities that we have here, which is a combination of the CT simulator, the diagnostic in imaging with the MRIs and the PET scans, and the computers that allow us to put all of this together. And it allows us to form, as I said, a three-dimensional picture of your anatomy. And armed with that three-dimensional picture, we can begin, as you see on the right side, to start defining a series of beams, crisscrossing so they all intersect on the target. 
but they go through different areas of normal tissue on their way to the target. What this does is allow us to build up the dose to the target, because that gets hit with every beam, while reducing the dose to the surrounding normal tissues. And again, we have other computers, immensely powerful, that have to do hundreds of thousands of calculations for each one of these patients. Okay? The, the software alone, the software, costs a quarter of a million dollars. Okay? So here we have, on the left, a patient who has this small nodule in their lung. Now, the traditional option for treating a small nodule in the lung is a large operation. And that's a pretty good procedure. And the thoracic surgeons are getting better and better every day at trying to make that procedure a little more easily tolerable. But there's no question that when one of these fellows, and they're very nice people, but when they come at you with a very sharp object in their hand, and they're intending to carve you up, uh, that's a big deal. And a lot of the people who are in possession of little lumps in their lung have smoked a few too many cigarettes, and their lungs are not in good shape, and they probably have a little heart disease, and many of them are not good candidates for the operation. So here's a kind of Buck Rogers treatment with a ray that goes through you without cutting you that allows us, by sending these beams, from different directions to focus radiation intensely on a target like this and deliver a dose of radiation that can eradicate a mass like this in more than 90% of cases, which is basically the same success that the surgeons have cutting it out. So it forms a wonderful alternative that we never had before the era when we could accurately define the tumor when we had the computing power to do these very complex treatment plans. But now we can offer this to patients. And here again, what you see is this tumor looking in three different projections. In cross section here, this is from the front, this is from the side. Now you can see that this lump here is rather close to some handy little structures, including your spinal cord, which lives right here. And we want to treat as little of that normal lung as possible. And these lines that you see wrapped around the lump are what we call isodose lines. They give us an idea of what the dose is along that line. On this right-hand side, you see something that looks a little technically complex, but trust me, it's not. What you want to achieve is something that goes out here and drops off suddenly, as you see the red line and the pink line. That's the dose to the cancer. These other lines, way back here, that's the dose to the lungs and the spinal cord. And you want as big a separation between those lines as you can get. Because the less dose you deliver to the normal tissues, the less chance you might hurt them. The greater the dose you can deliver to the tumor, the greater the chance you can control the cancer. Just generating that curve, which shows us the exact volume of these structures that receive a certain dose, requires huge computing power. This didn't exist a few decades ago, but now it's a routine part of our practice. Now, not only are we better able to target cancers and use our simulator and our powerful computers to design treatments that give high doses to these cancers, but we also have great advances in the actual delivery of radiation. And this is where our linear accelerator comes into play. This is the machine that actually delivers the treatment. Now, there are some patients in whom we deliver a different kind of treatment called a radioactive implant, but the vast majority of patients receive treatments on a machine that looks like this. In fact, this, this is, we have a true beam linear accelerator. That's the one that is in our uh, radiation oncology department. Now, this is an unbelievable engineering marvel. What this machine basically does is it takes 
electricity out of a wall plug. Your wall plug electricity is 120 volts. So every little electron coming out of that wall plug has the power equivalent to a 120 volt battery. Keep in mind, your car gives 12 volts to the electrons that circulate through your car. Your electricity from the power company is 120 or to run your big appliances, 240. Well, what we do is we take those little electrons and we accelerate them to huge velocity, which is another way of saying we give them a great deal of energy. And to put this in perspective, we raise the energy of the electrons from about 120 volts to over 15 million volts. And then what we do is we slam those energetic electrons moving at very high speed into a metal target. And as they slam into that target, they come to an abrupt halt. But they have to get rid of all that energy that they carried in there, and that energy goes through as x-rays of great power. And that's what this machine does. So think of it as having the capability of a 15 or 20 million volt battery packed into a space that's two or three feet long. A true engineering marvel. And this has to be mobile. This thing can spin around the patient so that we can treat from different angles. Now, this particular machine is incredibly versatile because it can deliver X-ray beams of different energies. Some energies allow deeper penetration into the body. Some situations we want a lower energy. Well, we can vary the energy with this machine. It also gives us something other than x-rays to use for treatment, something where we move that metal target out of the way and we just send the electrons straight at the patient. And electrons have their own behavior in the body, and it's a very interesting behavior. They give a uniform dose in the tissue until they abruptly run out of gas. So if you have a tumor, let's say superficially, you can send this beam straight in treat the tumor, and it will come to a halt before it radiates the deeper tissues. So this is a very versatile machine. It also turns out it's rather rapid. It delivers radiation quickly, which is an important point, because if we had you on that table for 45, 50 minutes, the chances are pretty good that in spite of all of our wonderful targeting of your tumor, you might be wiggling around a little more than we would like. So this minimizes patient movement by allowing rapid treatment. And it is very precise. This entire seven or eight ton machine rotates around a point with an accuracy of less than a millimeter. So no matter where we rotate it, it doesn't shift its position. As, as one of the engineers for the company said, this machine would let you treat the seams on a baseball while sparing the rest of the baseball. So that's a very versatile machine, and that's what we use to deliver radiation here. And it comes into play, particularly this precision really pays off when we do a specialized kind of treatment that couldn't even be done in the past. It's called stereotactic radiosurgery, sometimes called stereotactic radiotherapy because there is no surgery involved. It's where we deliver very high doses in one, two, three, four, five treatments to very tiny, precise targets. And here we're looking at someone's brain. And look at the little circle there. There's a little tiny lesion right there. Now you could send the neurosurgeons in to cut that out. That's a big neurosurgical procedure with all of its risks. Or you could deliver a painless treatment that can be delivered in a matter of minutes that will eradicate a tumor like this with a very high probability. And this is the end result of all that complex simulation, imaging to define the location, calculating all of this, and then finally using a machine like that linear accelerator to deliver a treatment that in three dimensions precisely targets the lesion. But uh, trust me, from the, the little circles that you see around this, the dose is falling off very rapidly so there's very little dose to the surrounding normal brain tissue. Now that linear accelerator also has attached to it a capability 
of imaging the patient while they're on the table ready to get their treatment. We can actually use this linear accelerator not only to deliver a radiation treatment, we can also take a CAT scan picture. And we can also take regular x-ray pictures before we treat the patient so that we can check the location of the tumor and correct our positioning immediately before delivering the treatment. There are some structures in the body that roam around a little bit. Your prostate, for instance, shifts its position, can shift its position by a centimeter or so on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, that doesn't seem like very much, but that could be the difference between hitting or missing the target. So we can image some of these mobile targets immediately before delivering the treatment, and this machine has multiple different imaging capabilities to give us image guidance to assist our complex treatments. This machine also goes one step further. Remember I showed you that lung nodule moving with respiration. I could have shown you a pancreas moving with respiration. I could have shown you a lot of things that move around. But this treatment uh, machine facilitates what we call gated treatments. Now, gated treatments is where you compensate for the movement of tumors with breathing by turning the machine on and off according to where you are in your breathing cycle. So that you turn the machine on at a specific snapshot of time to catch the tumor in that position, and as the tumor moves with respiration out of the beam, the beam shuts off comes back on as you move back in. Now, we planned for these things. Again, you see the motion that we have to cope with down here with a lung tumor like this. And we actually have a device that we put on a patient's abdomen so that we can record where they are in their respiratory cycle as we are doing the four-dimensional simulation recording where their tumor is. And we can correlate all this with their respiratory cycle and that just adds an additional incredible layer of complexity to our calculations for a patient like this. Now here again, we've defined the location of the beam. You see some of the, the computer printout that accompanies all of this. We're looking in three different projections at the same tumor mass, and we calculate the distribution of radiation dose to that tumor. And particularly in someone whose lung function is very tenuous, you have to protect as much of that lung as you can, and gated treatments can allow us to protect that little bit of extra lung that we otherwise would have to include to make sure we accounted for the movement of the tumor. So here again, we have uh, the treatment is designed. You see the little circles around the target. Uh, the dose is dropping off very quickly as we get further away from that target. As you can see again from that typical diagram on the right, the target is getting dosed way out here. The normal lung, the rest of the lung, is dosed way back here. And the heart, way back here. So this allows us to deliver huge doses to the tumor, minimal doses to the normal tissue. And to do this requires, again, incredibly sophisticated delivery tools, such as the uh, linear accelerator that we are fortunate enough to have. Also, our timing could not have been better. We actually had put in an order for what was the state-of-the-art linear accelerator when this hospital was in the process of being designed. As we were building the hospital, this new machine was just released. And for an extra million dollars, we changed the purchase order to get this machine. Because this machine is the new digital platform on which the advances of the next decade or two are going to be based. This is the machine that all the new technology is designed for. So we were lucky. By a matter of a few months, we missed getting the last of the older machines, and instead we got one of the newest and most advanced linear accelerators that will take us into the next decade and allow us to continually upgrade our capabilities to make sure that we continue to be on the cutting edge of delivering radiation oncology to those unfortunate folks that need this help 
delivering high doses to carefully defined tumors while simultaneously minimizing the dose of the normal tissues so that we can attempt to get an uncomplicated cure for many of these patients. And in the future, there are great things coming down the line. And this is the machine that will help to get us there. There's what's called adaptive therapy. And adaptive therapy is the holy grail of radiation. It's changing the beam to follow the cancer target over time. Not only in the middle of a treatment as people breathe in and out, we can do that already, but it's also following and shrinking the beam as the cancer shrinks as the treatment goes on week by week. So this is, this is a true engineering marvel. We take no credit for it here. The credit belongs to those wonderful engineers who have done so much to make our life a lot easier. They, they don't get enough, uh, you know, we, we celebrate our celebrities. Uh, the, the people that need some celebration are those engineers who create these kind of marvels. Uh, this will be worth much more to you if you need it than somebody making a nice movie or cutting a nice record, trust me. And we are just fortunate that, that we are on the cutting edge with this technology. I hope you don't need it, but sadly I know that there will be those of you here in the room, perhaps myself included, who will, and I hope you will find it comforting to know that tucked over there at the other side of the hospital, we have the capability of helping you. <clears throat> Ideally, we may even be able to cure you of a cancer. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? <clears throat> the beam has to go through the muscles to get, get into the target if it's deep inside the body. But is any attempt to have probe uh, push into the middle of the body and then shoot the beams? Well, I think what you're talking about is what we call an implant. Yeah. It is possible to put radioactive sources, often in the form of little radioactive seeds or pellets, directly into a cancer, or in the case where you have a body cavity, like the vagina you can put radioactive sources into the uterus and deliver very high doses of radiation right to those structures. And we use that also. But most cancers in most locations are not well suited for those kind of implants. So we focus and concentrate the dose on the target and minimize the dose to the surrounding normal tissues, including the muscles, by by having multiple different beams all converging on the target, but all going through a different pathway to get to the target, so that the normal tissues don't see all of the beams. And that keeps the dose of those normal tissues as low as we can. But the target tumor gets hit by every different beam that we send in. And sometimes we're sending in, uh, well, an enormous number of different beams. Sure. The first one is, I, I always hear about lung cancer and how people who smoke cigarettes or other substances, they can be prone to lung cancer, but that's only 50% of the lung cancers. I don't know if that's true. And then what does that mean for the other 50%? The scientists find how the other 50% of lung cancers come about outside of cigarette smoking or secondhand smoking. So that's the first question. Should I just wait for that? All right, well, let, let me address that one. Uh, I, I mentioned a tumor board this Friday that when I was a medical student at Harvard, a very senior lung doctor made the statement to us medical students. He said that in a long career, he could count the number of people who had lung cancer who had never smoked on one hand. Well, I would say that I can count the number of people who have never smoked who have lung cancer that I see in two months fill up that one hand. And Peter sees them also. Uh, in his practice, there is a growing number of people who have never smoked who do not have an obvious cause for their cancer. They weren't necessarily exposed to secondhand smoke. Now, maybe there's some toxin in the environment that we're, we're not so tuned into. I mean, this is New Jersey, after all. But um, we just don't know. 
We don't know why these people are getting these cancers. And there's also been more of a shift. There, there are multiple different types of lung cancer. Squamous cancer used to be by far the most common cancer, and that was the typical smoker's cancer. But we're seeing a lot more adenocarcinomas now. But why, I don't know. It's the same way we see shifts in the pattern, the epidemiology of other cancers. We see a lot more adenocarcinomas of the esophagus when they used to be squamous cancers that were the most predominant. But we just don't know why. We treat them the same way, and they are the same devastating illness. Now, some of these people we're finding out, we're, we're looking at cancers more closely in the lung, some of them have certain markers, certain properties of their cancer cells that enable them to be treated with certain targeted therapies that Peter uses. And we have some, because of the, the nature of their cells and the targets on their cell surface, we have uh, a more likely possibility of getting a response from those tumors than those that don't have those markers. And that helps uh, the medical oncologists like uh, Dr. Yi to select the appropriate whole body therapy for those folks. But to get back to why we have these non-smokers getting lung cancer, we just don't know. Okay. That was your first question. I think you have two more. So the second thing you the second one is about, I saw this documentary called Forks Over Knives. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sorry, could you speak up a little while? I saw this documentary called Forks Over Knives, and, and Young and I, we saw this, and then we saw this study about the China study. So I'm not sure how much oncologists use the China study as something where it, it, it informs oncologists about the possibility of meat and um, cancers as a result of eating meat because they found in different parts of China they linked diets to cancers. And well, so I'm not sure. it's long been known that diet plays a role in certain cancers. For instance, it is known that in Japan, they have a much higher incidence of stomach cancer than we have in the West. But in Japan, they have a much lower incidence, for instance, of breast cancer than we have in the West. When you take Japanese and move them from Japan to the West, they get more breast cancers than they did in Japan and fewer gastric cancers. It is thought that some of that smoked fish that they seem to love in Japan may be the source of uh, some of that uh, gastric cancers. And we think the, the American diet and the fact that uh, women start menstruating much earlier than they do in Japan, which affects their hormonal milieu, plays a role. So the point is that all cancers ultimately are a combination of your genes and your environment. You have to have mutations. Some of those mutations you probably inherited from your parents. Then it's just a case of how many mutations do you have to acquire from your environment to tip you over the edge to get a cancer. And diet certainly plays a role. Uh, but, um, you know, again, you get back to how many people are, are willing to drastically change their diet to avoid a cancer that they may get 30 years later. Not very many. So, uh, you know, it's, it's worth knowing about it. We hope to learn more about the causes of cancer. But in terms of, uh, uh, on a practical level, I'm afraid that it's going to be a long time before we can eradicate these cancers before they start. And until then, we're going to have to rely on Dr. Yi's chemotherapy and my radiation treatments and the services of the good surgeons to help those of us who come down with the cancer. I think you had one more. <laughs> Well, it must come from something that the smoking process gives you because it's not the fish. So it's the processing. And you know, again, we see epidemiological differences all over the world. Uh, Chinese people get a lot of nasopharyngeal cancer. Uh, you know, there's uh, Egyptians get a lot of bladder cancer. That's probably because they get infected from the Nile with uh, an infection called schistosomiasis. So they have huge amounts of bladder cancer over there. Uh, different countries, different regions have different incidences of cancer. A reflection again of the fact that your environment, your diet, your activity level, everything can have an impact on whether you get cancer or not.
I have another question. Um, do you control the uh, the um, when you use the uh, the beam uh, linear accelerator? Uh, do you actually control the uh, the uh, depth of the beam? No, the beam the beam penetrates all the way through you when we're treating with X-rays. When we're using electrons, the beam runs out of gas, and how deeply it goes into you before it runs out of gas depends on how much energy we give the electrons, and we can control that. So the only kind of other particle that has the property where it runs out of gas at a certain depth, and so you have to control that depth, are protons. And there are 11 proton facilities in the country, so they're, they're not very common. But photons, they just shoot right through you, x-rays. So the only way to control the depth of the dose delivery is to have multiple beams converging from different directions. Yes, ma'am. Eradicate them? Can you control the size of the tumor? Well, there are many patients who unfortunately do not have curable cancers. We get asked to treat patients whose cancers we know we cannot cure. They may have widespread cancer. And we're asked in many cases to help them with a troublesome symptom. Maybe they have disease that is spread to a bone and it's causing some discomfort in the bone. It's not necessary for us to completely eradicate that cancer. We can relieve their symptoms by reducing their tumor burden with a more moderate dose of radiation. The goal for those patients is to treat their disease as though it were a chronic, incurable disease, like diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease. No one ever cures those things. But we help people to live with them. And, and again, this is what Dr. Yi does uh, and, and with many of his patients. We can't, we don't know how to cure their cancer, but we often know how to help them to live with it. Now, the prospects of their living forever with it aren't so good, but we hope to get them as much mileage as we can by keeping a lid on their cancer, and keeping it from flaring up. And radiation is often used when one particular aspect of a widespread cancer gets a little bit unruly and needs to be put in its place. Yeah. When do you decide whether you use radiation or chemotherapy? How, how is well, that's, cancer treatment is a collaborative venture that requires the interaction of surgeons, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists. All, all of these specialties are deal with experts in cancer. Each has a different kind of treatment to offer. Many of our patients will be seen by multiple different cancer specialists so that we can coordinate their care. It is not at all uncommon for patients to receive two or even all three of those treatment modalities. For example, a great many patients with localized breast cancer who have potentially curable cancer get surgery to remove their lump radiation to their breast, and chemotherapy to control the possibility of that they may have secret spread of their disease elsewhere in their body. So it's a matter of close coordination. Now, Peter and I have worked together for, what, 25 years, Peter. I mean, pretty much we know what each of us is going to do. That doesn't stop us from sending great big letters back and forth about every patient. But we have a pretty good idea of what we're going to do. And each week we actually get together for a tumor board here in this room in which uh, difficult cases are presented so that all the doctors who are interested in cancer care can chime in about how they think a patient should be best helped. So it's a matter of coordinating care amongst different specialists. Well, thank you all for your attention. Um, all of the speakers for giving such interesting talks, and now um, I'd like to invite all of you to share in a Korean meal. Okay. I just want to make a last comment.